Welcome to the Monterey County Office of Education's Professional Development Training, brought to you by Foster Youth Services. Welcome to Trauma-Informed Practices for Schools. Today you will learn, what is trauma? What are the effects of trauma? Triggers and behavior. Elements of a trauma-informed school. Tools, what can I do? And finally, self-care. This is exhausting. The American Psychological Association describes trauma as an emotional response to a terrible event. Immediately after the event, Shock and denial are typical. Longer-term reactions include unpredictable emotions, flashbacks, strained relationships, and even physical symptoms like headaches or nausea. There are numerous types of trauma. For example, historical trauma, community trauma, but they usually fall under one of these general types of trauma. Acute, chronic, and complex. An acute traumatic event is a single traumatic event, such as a car crash, a school shooting, or natural disasters, such as wildfires or earthquakes. Long-term exposure to trauma is considered to be chronic. Child abuse, domestic violence, homelessness, bullying, desertion, or racism are examples of chronic trauma. Exposure to multiple traumatic events, sometimes simultaneously, is how we would describe complex trauma. Some examples of complex trauma are growing up in a violent community while being abused at home or being bullied at school while experiencing racism. Human trafficking is considered to be a form of complex trauma because of the multiple angles of ongoing abuse, such as physical, sexual, and mental. Why is it important to understand the effects of trauma on students? Trauma not only affects their long-term health outcomes, but it could also affect their education as well. The Adverse Childhood Experiences, otherwise known as the ACES study, was conducted by Kaiser Permanente in San Diego and included 17,000 participants. Participants completed a 10-question A survey. The questions pertained to three areas. Household challenges, such as domestic violence, substance abuse, mental illness, parental separation or divorce, or having a parent who is incarcerated. Abuse, emotional, physical, or sexual. Neglect which includes emotional and physical neglect. This study revealed that something happens between infancy and adulthood to create a lifetime of addictions, abuse, and mental health issues. As the number of ACEs increases, so does the risk for long-term effects on mental, emotional, and physical health. A higher number of ACEs also affects education which we'll learn more about in this video. Adverse childhood experiences have a snowball effect over time. They could disrupt neurodevelopment, they could impair social, emotional, and cognitive functioning, which could result in the adoption of unhealthy behaviors, leading to disease, disability, or even social problems. And ultimately, the effects of ACEs could lead to an early death. As the number of ACEs increases, so does the risk for negative outcomes, such as alcoholism, drug abuse, and other maladaptive coping strategies, which could result in poor work performance, depression, financial stress, suicide attempts, and a wide variety of health issues.
Here are some statistics about ACEs-related substance abuse. As you can see, 99% of antidepressant users identified as having five or more ACEs. Children with higher ACEs are more likely to be retained, have lower verbal skills, more discipline referrals, increased externalizing and internalizing behaviors, difficulties with attention, lower test scores, more absences, higher suspension rates, and they have more difficulty in relating their emotions. Research strongly links suspension and other school disciplinary practices to failure to graduate. Exclusionary practices, such as suspension and expulsion, have been shown to cause students to become disenfranchised with school. Making them feel excluded from school could cause them to start finding other ways of fitting in. Research demonstrated that students who dropped out of high school were 63 times more likely to be incarcerated and college graduates. This is known as a school to prison pipeline. As we know, people react differently to these and other experiences, depending on their resiliency, protective factors, and self-regulation skills. Some examples of additional adverse experiences can include the death of a loved one, family separation, COVID, illness, homelessness, community violence, domestic abuse, fires, accidents, bullying, terrorism, and war. There are a wide variety of other experiences that we, individually, can perceive to be traumatizing. The ACE study makes one of the most compelling cases for addressing early trauma in that we now know that untreated adverse early childhood events don't just go away on their own, but rather will only exacerbate over time if untreated. Untreated trauma can also manifest in developmental delays, such as not talking or skill regression, in which they can walk but prefer to crawl. We also see this in the challenging behavior of young children in childcare who have been kicked out of multiple centers for unprovoked aggression, which for many is really a cry for help. In adolescence, untreated ACEs may manifest in more destructive ways. Studies of delinquent teens have found that many have four to 10 ACEs. Researchers from Northwestern University recently gave psychiatric evaluations to more than a thousand young detainees at the Cook County Juvenile Temporary Detention Center in Chicago and found that 84% of the detainees had experienced two or more serious childhood traumas and that the majority had experienced six or more. More than 40% of the girls had been sexually abused as children. More than half of the boys said that at least once they had been in situations so perilous that they thought they, or people close to them, were about to die or be badly wounded. In adults, ACEs may manifest in destructive physical and mental health. One study found 
that 75% of women in psychiatric units had a history of early abuse. Similarly, with substance abuse, many have unresolved early adverse experiences, which they have numbed or self-medicated with drugs and alcohol. In general, the responses of children are varied according to the relational supports in their lives. The resiliency factor is not so much getting over it or bouncing back, but more about the ability for relationships to buffer and heal the trauma. Dr. Vince Felitti, the author of the A study, defines resiliency as the deep belief that at one time you really mattered to someone. The ability to heal and move beyond trauma is now known to be greatly influenced by the number and quality of supportive relationships in a traumatized child's life, also known as protective factors. This is key. We all have the opportunity, no matter what our job or role at school, to be this person to a student. Earlier, we defined the different types of trauma. Now, we're going to define traumatic stress. Traumatic stress is an overwhelming experience. It involves a threat. It results in vulnerability and loss of control. It leaves people feeling helpless and fearful, and it interferes with relationships and beliefs. When the amygdala responds to a perceived threat, it activates the fight, flight, freeze response. And when this happens, the prefrontal cortex shuts down and there is an increase in stress hormone levels. The more trauma we experience, especially as young children, the easier this response is activated. When it is activated, the child can often look aggressive resistant to services, disconnected from others, constantly running away, freezing when confronted, lying, or using substances for coping. The chemical that is released is called cortisol, also known as a stress hormone. And it is released by the adrenal glands, which are part of the endocrine system. Toxic stress is prolonged and serious stress that negatively affects healthy development by adversely impacting areas of the brain dedicated to learning and reasoning. Here is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Survival, security, belonging, importance, self-actualization. Children exposed to trauma invest energy into survival instead of developmental mastery and development may continue to be impacted well into adulthood. What activates our internal alarm system? Triggers. Some common triggers include loud noises, like a school bell, police officers or fire persons, schedule changes, minimum days, testing days, fire and or earthquake drills, picture day, sights and smells, resemblances, physical and verbal, terms of endearment, or unexpected touch. It can take time to realize you are dealing with a trigger. Often, it involves knowing and being engaged with a student over time. It could be a response that doesn't make sense in any other way. Remember, sometimes students' responses do not always match our expectations. For example, depression in children often looks like anger. Some signs of trauma in young children may include irritability, startling easily, or frequent tantrums. Signs of trauma in elementary school-aged children may include difficulty paying attention, being withdrawn or quiet, frequent tears or sadness, talking often about scary feelings or ideas, fighting with peers or adults. Signs of trauma in adolescents may include talking about trauma incidents constantly or denying that it happened, 
refusal to follow rules, or talking back frequently, engaging in risky behaviors, fighting, and not wanting to spend time with friends. Being a trauma-informed school is not a program to implement. It is an awareness tool meant to change the perception of student behavior and to ensure disciplinary practices consider the background and circumstances of the child's life. Elements of a trauma-informed school include leadership investment, professional development, access to resources and services, trauma-informed teaching and non-academic strategies, trauma-sensitive policies, including disciplinary practices, and finally, it includes collaboration with stakeholders. Additionally, being a trauma-informed school ensures that staff understands what trauma is and understand how trauma manifests itself. Remembering that the trauma does not define a child. They are not their trauma, so no labeling, just a deeper understanding. It may also include healing-centered engagement, where each adult recognizes their own trauma and triggers before responding to behaviors. Trauma-informed staff should know where to turn to and what resources are available for students they suspect have experienced trauma. And finally, trauma-informed schools adjust their teaching and discipline styles to meet the needs of traumatized students. You may wonder, how do I separate out the trauma to determine a child's special education needs? The answer is that you don't. Look to the underlying causes of issues a child might be having and treat them. This should apply regardless of cause. Also, it is always a best practice to use collaborative and proactive solutions. What skills is the child lacking? What are their strengths? Solve the problems collaboratively and proactively for the best interest of the child. Being trauma-informed is a paradigm shift. It changes the question from, what is wrong with you, to, what happened to you? And even further, what's right with you? What are your strengths? Understand that trauma explains behavior. It does not excuse behavior. Problem behaviors are often due to a desire to self-protect, or they are a coping mechanism. The three steps to helping a student with problem behaviors are to reflect, connect, and redirect. First, reflect on what we know about the student or why he may be acting out. Next, connect with him. Remember to use a human connection. Finally, redirect the behavior with examples of positive ways the student could express his behavior. When using video to assess student attention in virtual class meetings, always consider that there may be legitimate reasons why they are not turning on their video. They might be uncomfortable displaying their living spaces to their peers. They may not want their image captured, recorded, or shared. Or they might not have reliable internet or poorly working devices. Here is a useful tip sheet that you can Google for more information. Trauma results in a loss of sense of safety. Safety is a human being's number one priority. This includes both physical and emotional safety. Emotional safety is created by empowering others, providing choices, fostering connections, and opportunities to develop genuine relationships. Provide a sense of control. A couple examples include giving students choices and not ultimatums. Providing adequate personal space. If the student tells you to back off, give them more space. And keeping verbal interactions calm and using simple, direct language.
foster connections. A couple examples include healthy relational interactions with safe and familiar individuals can buffer and heal trauma-related problems. Research shows social connectedness as a protective factor against maltreatment. Connecting. Connections are created by role modeling, listening, being present, respectful interactions, and genuine interactions. Remember that connections must be built at all levels. Staff to student, staff to staff, student to student, staff to caretakers, and a choice, allowing input on decisions, and using students' names are a few ways you can build personal relationships with students. Other tips include greeting students in the hallway, listening without judgment, and helping them problem solve by asking open-ended questions to further the conversation. Trauma impacts the way in which self-regulating skills are formed. It directly influences how a student develops their coping skills. Schools that strive to build safe and nurturing environments where relationships are valued are more likely to promote and foster positive coping skills for their students. Some school-based programs that support trauma-informed practices are positive behavioral interventions and supports, also known as PBIS, restorative practices, socio-emotional learning programs, and developmental assets. Problem-solving skills include assessing the situation, gathering options, making a choice, acting upon that choice, then evaluating the effectiveness of that choice. Important factors to consider in assessing our own style and effectiveness of communication include words, tone, and body language. It is not just what we say or how we say it, but what our body language is conveying. Another way of helping students to learn about their behaviors is to help them build affect identification. Suggest different ways to express their feelings. For example, instead of saying, I am feeling good, teach them to say, I am delighted, loved, or contented. Instead of saying, I feel sad, try, I am uncomfortable, worried, or concerned. Instead of saying, I am angry, try, I am embarrassed, overwhelmed, or I'm annoyed. Building affect identification also connects their emotions with body sensation, thoughts associated with feelings and behaviors, or manifestation of feelings. It provides context externally, for example, smells and sounds, or internally, for example, is he or she tired or hungry? Using literature, music, or film to help kids learn to identify emotions is also an effective tool. Let's use undue attention as an example. Your perception is that Tony is being a nuisance. He is showing off or acting like a class clown. He is being disruptive, blurting things out, or is pestering the teachers or others. You may feel annoyed or irritated. Your mistaken reaction is to remind him that his behavior is unappreciated, or you try to coax him to stop. Tony responds by stopping temporarily. Effective responses can be applied if you could take into consideration that Tony's behavior is really saying, notice me, or involve me. 
and your reactions could relay that he is cared for. You could redirect Tony by assigning a task so he can gain useful attention, use problem-solving tools with him, or even set up non-verbal signals. Educators and empathy. Empathy is the identification with, or the experiencing of, the feelings, thoughts, or attitudes of others. Compassion satisfaction. The positive feelings we get when we realize that the compassion we put in working with others is resulting in some relief, growth, or healing. Empathy is a double-edged sword. It provides healing power. However, empathy for the traumatic pain of another can result in personal upset or pain for the listener. When empathy for a student suffering leads to internalizing or frightening realities not personally experienced, we call this vicarious trauma. Constant demands to care for others may cause fatigue, emotional stress, or apathy. When trauma repeatedly overwhelms our ability to function normally, we may experience compassion fatigue. High levels of compassion fatigue can, over time, lead to burnout. Burnout is physical and emotional exhaustion involving the development of negative self-concept, job attitudes, and loss of concern and feeling for our students, their parents, and our colleagues. The impact of vicarious trauma can affect job tasks, morale, interpersonal relationships, behavior, and physical and emotional health. Some self-care techniques include physical fitness, nutrition and hydration, ensure that you're getting enough sleep and rest, learn to say no, create a space for centering and solitude, find a creative outlet, make time for fun and enjoyment, and most importantly, create a plan for self-care. So ask yourself, what can I do for myself today to take care of myself? Plan to take a walk, Spend some time with family or friends, or spend time doing something you enjoy, and make time for it every single day. The Monterey County Office of Education Foster Youth Services Program thanks you for your support.